First, I'd like to thank Noreen Tomasi and the staff here at the Center for Fiction for coordinating the Roger Shattuck Prize for Criticism now in its third year. Uh, in addition, as the host for the First Society of America, the Center is the appropriate home for Roger Shattuck's books and papers. I do encourage you to go up and visit the room. It's a nice space. Noreen has taken care to follow my mother Nora's wishes regarding these two efforts. And we're grateful for her guidance and support. We appreciate the work of the selection committee, of course. They have selected six impressive critics whose works are reminiscent of Roger Shannon's writings while making their own way. Now I'd like to say a few personal words about my father that might provide some insight into his character and about my mother because this prize is largely her doing. Roger was a man of curious contrasts. He was a creative and fiercely independent man who questioned many things, wars, religion, postmodernism to name a few. But he was also a believer in routine, discipline, and physical labor. He honored craftsmen, simple tools, and methods that worked. This was the side of him that we saw at home. Scythed around all the emerging rocks in our horse pastures as the farm all a tractor could not mow close enough. He would stop to sharpen the long blade with a stone and tell me exactly how the stroke and angle should be made to get the proper edge. He routinely won the Addison County Scything Contest, eventually <laughs> graduating to the seasoned stock class in his late 70s. He made sourdough bread weekly for over 30 years in a huge brown ceramic mixed and careful proportion store-bought flour and wheat berries, which he ground by hand using a mill in the basement. His recipe remained the same for the entire time with one exception, the introduction of mace. He found this flavor so appealing that it ended any further departures from a perfectly good loaf of bread. <laughs> bread making was one of the many rituals he had that seemed to fuel him and give him comfort. Routines and rit rituals and physical work like making bread or scything, were really about discipline. And he made no secret of his belief that man was lacking without discipline. Out of hard work and discipline came enlightenment. <clears throat> Nora represents the quintessential contrast to Roger. One of Roger's Yale buddies set up a double date with two ballerina sisters from Ottawa one night after a performance. They went to a late night jazz club to see Billie Holiday. The boys wanted to drink wine, and the dancers just wanted to look at the menu, as they did not typically eat before performance. Nora and her sister Patricia left their home in Ottawa as young teenagers to study dance in New York City and live with a host family. Soon they were given the opportunity to tour the world with the Valley Rules to Monte Carlo. Of course they accepted. They were performing artists and no need for a high school degree. After marrying, Nora opened dance schools in Cambridge and Austin, but she was also expected to entertain for countless department dinners and parties. The typical scenario was for at least three or four people <coughs> at the party, tired of the highbrow discussions in the living room, to find refuge in the kitchen with Nora, where she was setting out her liver pate or profondo. She knew about food and good posture and movement and people. She always had an opinion about the academic types and could sniff out someone who was full of themselves. Her candor and unpretentious nature endeared her to many and still do today. I like to think about the love affair between the intellectual from a society family and the feisty dollar. I leave it to the critics to mull over how these contrasts might have influenced his writing. In closing, I would like to recognize more. Since Roger's death in 2005, she spent a good deal of time worrying about what to do with the thousands of books, filling shelves in every room and hallway of their cabin, crowding the tiny study across the meadow where he worked, and jammed into closets and basement corners. Roger left no instructions for his wife of 56 years about his life's work, no suggestion for additional publications or preference of where his many books and papers would end up. He left these decisions to his ballerina bride with no academic degrees until earning her GED in the 1970s. But thanks to her good instincts and the help of many people here tonight, 
I think she's done a nice job. Patricia, who was my sister-in-law, when she was in fourth grade, she warmly welcomed me into that family that was 40-some years ago. She was the warmest. <laughs> I met Roger Shattuck in October or November of 1970 in West Philadelphia, where Roger was visiting his daughter. Terry was attending the university there, as I was. I had just met and fallen for her in September of that year, a month or two before. Shattuck, born in this town that we're in tonight, uh, was 47 years old and living in Austin, Texas, and was on his way to deliver a Gauss lecture in Princeton, and had stopped to take Terry uh, up there with him, and Terry wanted to introduce me to him. It was like Roger to include someone in his ventures when the opportunity for relevant education was present as it was then. The two of us picked him up at Philadelphia's then Little Airport. I remember a week or so before this, a telephone call that Terry placed to Roger in Austin from her Walnut Street apartment regarding the logistics of the Philadelphia Princeton trip, in which her end of the conversation included, I've just met a fellow who's read your books. For some reason, I could hear Roger's end of the telephone line, and he responded, you've got to watch out for that kind. <laughs> Indeed, that sentence can have several meanings. But his daughter did watch out for me for the rest of her life, which ended some 20 years later, in 1993, when she was 41 years old. And I watched out for her, and I watched out for him, too. So I'm here tonight to watch out for Roger Shattuck. My way of doing that tonight is to tell you as quickly and emphatically and politely as I can that a biography of Shattuck could be a well-received and enlightening book. That we can view a great many themes in his life, themes that the present world would be interested in, that a sharp and discerning thinker and writer could do well for him or herself with and many could profit by the useful intellectual enterprise. As some of you know, Jed Pearl and Bob Weil have already written well on Shattuck, and Jed may be thinking further on this. More is required, however, and I want us to be aware of the possibility of a biography of Roger Shattuck. Now's not the time to make the case, but only to say it out loud, as if that can help to make it real. Roger himself was fond of setting goals and making work for himself and for others, believing that a regimen produced results. So here is the assignment. It's for all of us, but it's real and it's rigorous. Help us help ourselves by remembering Shattuck. It's appropriate to say this here as the Center for Fiction has already done its part, a good one. I want to thank uh, Noreen Tomasi and the Center for Fiction and Noreen, here is a little homemade, fancily veneered wood box for you in appreciation. Stan Burnett and the Proust Society of America for helping to remember him and his, and his various good examples and helping these younger thinkers with their own goals. And I want to congratulate Ruth Franklin and David Yaffe, of course. I miss Roger. I'd rather be talking about books and life with him tonight than talking about him. But I'm here tonight to watch out for him. And though he needs no help from me at this moment, and rarely did, I'm here and I offer it. to you 
uh, Mara Sticks team, who will present the award to David Yaffe. We don't actually present an award, so that's a little bit of a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> person to introduce. We were thinking of getting a cup or something, but we don't do that. There is an award, but we don't actually present a, anything that looks like an Oscar. Um, so, but um, Mars will introduce David. Um, Mars um, has a very, very long and very distinguished um, biography, and I can't read it here tonight. I encourage you, if you don't know his work well, to get to know it. It's really extraordinary. He's uh, currently a distinguished professor of English and theater at the Graduate Center at the City University, as well as a senior fellow at the Center um, for the Humanities. Um, which he founded in 1993. And I'll just uh, name um, two books which I just find absolutely extraordinary, Gates of Eden and Dancing in the Dark, A Cultural History of the Great Depression. For the rest of his bibliography, I think you'll have to go online, but I urge you, at the very least, you must read those two. Join me in welcoming Morris Thank you, Noreen, and thank you for your wonderful stewardship of the Center for Fiction, which I've been fond of in all of its incarnations as the Mercantile Library and everything else that you've, it's been and everything that you've done with it. Um, it's, I'm here to present this award, which is not an award, but it is an award to, to David. I'm so pleased to be sharing it with, with Franklin, whose work I also know and admire and like and love, in fact. Uh, <laughs> It's easy for me to date uh, when I first got to know David Yaffe. Uh, appropriately, it's linked to a great poet, a uh, poet on whom I wrote my first book, John Keats. Uh, it was the bicentennial of Keats's birth, born in 1795, and the bicentennial came in 1995. And uh, I was afraid that I had missed the bicentennial. But I decided at the last moment to give a course on Keats, which I hadn't taught in a very long time. Now Keats, in one of his many remarkable remarks in his letters, uh, let loose the phrase that I think that I shall be among the English poets after I'm gone or after I die, and so on. A remarkable statement that's on the one hand, breathtaking for a poet who was completely unknown, who was only known for having been subjected to some of the most vicious attacks ever perpetrated on an English poet. He was a poet who was still in his mid, early to mid-20s. Uh, it's a modest statement uh, among the English poets, but also breathtaking for someone his age and his lack of reputation. Uh, it's it's keyed with the delicate reserve that he always expresses, both in his letters and his poems. Uh, and so I decided to give a course called Keats Among the Poets, just to see whether and how Keats's work and his reputation had actually survived him, and in the only way that it really matters, and that is how his legacy had been taken up by other writers. And the first half of this course was easy. It was coming back six or seven weeks on Keats, which I love doing. But the second half of the course was to deal with half a dozen other poets who in various, often very oblique ways, had taken up the torch from Keats and had represented elements of his influence. And uh, frankly, this second part of the course left me in a complete state of terror because it involved teaching a number of poets who not only had I never taught, but whom I was sure I didn't understand in any way, shape, or form, including such as Hart Crane and Wallace Stevens. I put them very briefly as a graduate student, but then very badly at the time as well. Now, the course went well enough, uh, thanks almost entirely to the help that I got from the students in the class, especially two whom I remember sitting at the very far end of the seminar table. Uh, and uh, one was Amy Leo, who was quiet and deep, exceptionally thoughtful. Uh, but there was nothing quiet about the guy who sat <laughs> next to her, uh, because it became pretty clear very quickly that he had an encyclopedic knowledge of English and American poetry, and an extraordinary faculty for reading and interpreting it, even at its most difficult. 
And the papers they wrote toward the end of the course were every bit up to their class contributions. In fact, I recall urging Amy to publish a paper, work on her, publish, uh, her, her paper more and, and to publish it. I don't, don't think she ever did, but uh, I had long since realized that they were a couple and had been since their undergraduate days at Sarah Lawrence. Uh, but their very presence in the class made teaching a kind of joy, partly because of the give and take. Uh, I had, as, I had uh, as much to, I had a great deal to learn from them, perhaps as much or more as they had to learn from me. And, uh, and, and uh, I think I gradually understood that part of David's gifts was that he not only had a good feeling for literature and for poetry especially, but also he had a completely other field about which he was just as knowledgeable, and that was music, especially jazz. Now, with any, without any special effort or pressure, David was determined over the years to educate me in music, especially because I had been working on a book on the 1930s, and there was no way that jazz could be left out of that book. Uh, and yet, I was in no way capable of including it. <laughs> David gave me a discography of swing music, gave me some wonderful tapes. I recall Ella and Lewis riffing on songs from Porgy and Bess. I recall another tape, that, uh, a mixtape that, uh, that David and Amy made for me when they graduated as a sort of thank you gift. Uh, uh, these are things that I listen to uh, again and again, especially in the car. Now all this would be purely personal if David had not already begun to publish widely, both as a book reviewer and as a music critic. Now very few graduate students have either the time or the gift for literary journalism at the highest level. But early on, David almost miraculously developed a very, a very fluent ability, a gift, really, for making difficult subjects and serious ideas come alive for a general audience. It's much harder than you'd think. Uh, even fewer young critics have two widely different, yet matching areas of expertise. Uh, uh, David had already built a substantial career uh, uh, and since then, David has already built a substantial career on the rarefied terrain of the interface between literature and music, uh, which he's, his work has done so much to illuminate. Uh, David is coming up for tenure, he tells me, at Syracuse University, where he teaches. And he told me that he is the first person in his department who has been told not to submit all his publications <laughs> for, for simply only a selection, since his articles and such publications as The Nation and Book Forum have been so numerous that no one could be expected to read them all. <laughs> I could not begin to list them here, but I do want to mention his two books, both wonderfully supple and concise. Uh, Non-writers have no idea how much more difficult it is to write a shorter book than it is to write a long book. Uh, the first fascinating rhythm, uh, I think based on his thesis, was a virtuoso account of the many ways jazz has touched American writers. From those completely steeped in jazz, like Ralph Ellison and Albert Murray, to those mythologizing it, often ham-handedly, like Norman Mailer, to those who unexpectedly reached for it from afar, like Hart Crane and Wallace Stevens, uh, those, those this very same two poets who bedeviled us in our Keats course. Now, nor did David neglect the writings on ja of jazz men themselves, such as the, that of the inimitable Charles Mingle. Now, David's second book, Bob Dylan, Like a Complete Unknown, is neither a biography or a systematic critical study, but a sort of potholing into various aspects of D Dylan's discography, his writing and prose, his performance style, and especially his protean shifts of identity as reflected in those performances. Now, David's book exudes a total mastery of the Dylan canon, uh, over 500 songs, he tells us. It has already played an important role in the current Dylan revival, capped by Dylan's return to endless touring, an amazing thing for someone his age. By his 70th birthday, uh, David's book was published for his 70th birthday. And, uh, and just this week, by Dylan's receipt from President Obama of the National Medal of Freedom, an event that produced 
one of the most iconic photographs of the enigmatic figure, hidden and unreachable behind his dark shades and his, uh, and his stoic, expressionless face, an image that is sure to reap many more reams of comment. Uh, the fact is, it's an image that really confirms the title of David's book. It's a, uh, the cover of David's book is a really a man without a face. And the title is, from Dylan himself, Dylan, like a complete unknown. If there were ever a picture that showed Dylan as a completely unknown and perhaps in some ways unknowable figure, it would be uh, the picture of Dylan receiving uh, this award from the president. One last word. I, I, I was delighted to hear the, the tales of uh, Roger Shattuck's life and work. Uh, I knew him mainly through the Association of Literary Scholars and Critics. I deeply admired his work. I think he was the very model of a gifted essayist and all-purpose man of letters. And I'm pretty sure uh, he would have been delighted by the two very fine critics who are today honored in his name. Thank you, uh, thanks, Morris. Uh, thank you to the Shattuck family. Uh, thank you to Maureen and everybody at the Center for Fiction. Um, and uh, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be associated with Roger Shattuck, um, who guided me through my first readings of Proust, um, readings of Proust that were much more mastered by my amazing wife, Eva uh, I, uh I, I skipped a volume or two of, of Proust, and yet I still use the term Proustian, which is really shameful. But uh, Amy has read all of Proust like three times or something. Um, and uh, you know, we have a two and a half year old son, but I see that she's still sitting there. So in case she's not here when I think her, I just want to think her now first. Uh, Amy, I love you. I wouldn't be here without you. Um, um, this is a, a short passage I'm going to start with. Um, it's, it's from the, it's the end of uh, James Joyce's Portrait of an Artist as a Young Man. Most of you will be familiar with it. Um, I want to dedicate it to my parents who are both here. And uh, um, most of you will know this already, but um, uh, Stephen, this is from the voice of Stephen Dedalus. Um, and uh, he makes a reference to his race and he's talking about the Irish race, but um, we humanists, and I imagine Roger Shattuck included, take it to mean more the, not the Irish race, but the human race. Okay, so this is, this is Joyce. Mother is putting my new secondhand clothes in order. She prays now, she says, that I may learn in my own life and away from home and friends what the heart is and what it feels. Amen, so be it. Welcome, O oh life, I go to encounter for the millionth time the reality of experience and to, forge it in the, and to forge in the smithy of my soul the uncreated conscience of my race. Old father, old artificer, stand me now and ever in good stead. The first time I read these lines by James Joyce, I was a teenager, and my furtive searches for what the heart is and what it feels. Contemplating art, or artifice, would deepen later. Uh, forging in the smithy of my soul sounded better than law school. <laughs> there was something foolhardy about the prospect of living by my wits, but I didn't know what else to do. Even as I was surrounded by a chorus of well-meaning Cassandras. I think being a critic is a natural response to life, and it starts with consciousness itself. I have vivid memories of the records in my parents' collection. My father had almost entirely Bach, Haydn, and Mozart, who dominated everything else as my, father, as my father became roughly the age I am now, and I became 10. Uh, his, re his repressed Puccini was banished to the bottom shelf. <laughs> my mother had the soundtracks to Her Day's Night of the Graduate, and the original Broadway soundtrack recordings to practically everything. My grandmother had season tickets to every musical that came to town, and before I saw the shows, I heard the soundtracks. I would become used to Zero Mostel and Fiddler on the Roof, and so it set up for disappointment. I think I saw Leonard Nimoy. 
<laughs> uh, just as I learned in preschool, whether cupcakes were, for, were homemade or from a mix, and I later learned that it was rude to inquire about such things, I knew the difference between original Broadway casts and the touring companies that would come to the flyover country of Dallas. I ended up performing as a teenage restaurant pianist and in a new school jazz band. Even though I still play nearly every day, I managed to today, uh, my ears were and still are much better than my chops. Making music and having perfect pitch, a mixed blessing in many ways, gave me an advantage, almost like a secret handshake, and it made the art of writing about music all the more difficult. How could I, tr how could I translate uh, what I was hearing note for note for those hearing emotion for emotion, which I heard too. Music presents a private synesthesia for me. I can see the patterns on the keyboard and visualize chords. Uh, and by visualizing chords, I mean the shape of them, uh, clusters and melodies. How could a flourish of language match what Walter Pater famously called the condition of music? Uh, and I recently uh, came across this passage uh, from J.M. Katsaya um, from his novel Disgrace uh, that seemed to capture this as well. The origins of speech lie in song. And the origins of song in the need to fill out with song the overlarge and rather empty human soul. Um, the downside of this is that bad music will involuntarily take over my brain if I'm exposed to it enough, unwelcome guests, and my gray matter. Differentiating between good and bad music, or even good and great music, is the first and only the first part of the job. Making it leap off to the page is more important. My favorite way of listening to recorded music is still lying in bed in the dark with no other sensory competition. Hours of listening to Joni Mitchell was in this way since I was 15 prepared me to meet her although there was really nothing that could have prepared me for the cauldron that followed. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> uh, our, our first meeting lasted 12 hours, and it would have lasted longer if I didn't have a plane to catch. Uh, among many other things, she distrusted the analytical mode. My day job is in a university English department, in which the ultimate compliment is to be smart. <laughs> In Joni's world, the ultimate compliment is to be soulful. I see the binary before me in the world in which I walk, still wanting to be soulfully smart or intelligently soulful. I am now writing for my life to capture the amazing and terrifying Joni Mitchell for Sarah Crichton at FSG, and I'm grateful to Sarah's grateful for Sarah's generosity and patience. Writing, like any other skill, is mimetic. I started collecting dusty old issues of Rolling Stone when I was ten and subscribed to the magazine until I was 19 and thought I had outgrown their demo. By then, I was reading the classic new journalism of Tom Wolfe and Joe Didion. I dreamed of doing something like that. I traded my Rolling Stone subscription for a New Republic subscription uh, after they addressed me with a flyer that said, Dear Intelligent American. <laughs> Be still my heart. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you played them. Um, so when I arrived at the, 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 the paper formerly known as the Village Voice, uh, as an intern, my sophomore year in college, trying to be an intelligent American, I looked around the place and felt like I was where I needed to be. I was 20, the final year of childhood and the brink of adulthood, or so says the right more. Uh, this was the early 90s when The Voice was still an independent paper, when giants like Gary Giddens and Jim Hoberman circulated the cubicles, when print was king and Pluto was a planet. <laughs> In the pre-email age, a pitch meant sending a fax on voice stationery or persuading an editor in a cubicle at 36 Cooper Square. My academic reading and my freelance journalism were growing apace. And I got away with the opening of one of my very first pieces with an adorer quotation I had just picked up in a modernism class. The more I wrote, the less mystified the process became. When I was 20, I had to be in the zone. When I was 23, I had to pay the rent. <laughs> Some wonderful guys to the perplexed came along. 
And Sarah Lawrence, they call advisors dons, like it's Oxford or the mob. <laughs> and my don uh, was Nick Mills, who's here. Uh, my first New York intellectual uh, who got me into the patients of dissent. I was impressed that he was an Irving Howe protege, even more flattered that he wanted to take me under his wing in a similar fashion even as he was correcting my use of that and which. <laughs> then, at the tender age of 20, I found myself over my head with an assignment for, for the Village Voice Classical Music Supplements, which is something that actually existed. Um, and the empathetic uh, Tim Page, when he was still at Newsday, uh, who had recently published a collection of the Oxford, suggested I read another book from the same season. And he had the press send me both books. That other book, was Double Asian by Morris Dickstein. And I was impressed that this was someone who is an English professor at the Canadian Graduate Center who wrote parts of the book for, for M. Mark at the Village Voice Literary Supplement, something else that used to exist. I devoured the book as soon as I had it in my hands. When I was in the middle of consuming it, someone on the F train from Brooklyn asked me my opinion on Edmund Wilson, <laughs> someone I was just learning about from those pages. <laughs> If that person had asked me just a week later, I would have told them. <laughs> uh, I've been very fortunate in my teachers, Morris Dickstein, uh, Luke Manant, Wayne Kustenbaum. I was in awe of these people, and I still am. They showed me that criticism is an art like anything else. And there are some who do it exceptionally well. Another teacher who affected me deeply was Harold Bloom, when he was not finding elaborate ways to appreciate my wife's brilliance and hotness. <laughs> He showed me that criticism, at its best, is not parasitic on literature, but is a genre of it. The criticism of Hazlitt, or Dr. Johnson, or Coleridge, or Henry James, or Samuel Beckett, or, Bloom would never admit it, even T.S. Eliot, can be a thing of beauty and a joy forever, surpassing utterance just like the best poems, plays, or novels. I also relate to Bloom's answer to the questions, the question of how he was so productive insomnia, and many, many enemies. <laughs> Harold had good taste, and admiring my wife, he knew ill, and she's still here, that's incredible. Uh, uh, I could not admire anyone else anymore. She has not only been my, be my best reader, but she is an amazing writer, an amazing scholar, and a heroic mother to her son, Julian, who's also here. I began writing professionally at 20, and fell in love with Amy at 21, and I am still falling in love with her every day. I remember a New Yorker cartoon depicting an editor and a writer. Caption, now make it sing. <laughs> Over the years, I have been fortunate to have editors who have allowed my work to sing and who have taken care to make me look good. My first editor at The Nation was the late, great John Leonard, whose legendary status was matched by his desire to champion young writers, and at 24, I was one of them, proudly. Uh, later, I benefited hugely by being edited by Adam Schatz, who is another one of John Leonard's young writers, an editor with whom I shared aesthetic passions and who raised the stakes in every way, um, being edited by John Palatella, the current literary editor of The Nation, makes me feel like I'm in the hands of the poetry scholar that he is, sensitive, I'm one of the few people who knows that he has a PhD, uh, sensitive to the art of the perfect line, the perfect sentence, the perfect beat. Bill Frucht, who couldn't be here, my editor at Yale, uh, knew what questions to ask when I was finishing my book about Dylan. Writing for him is like having a marvelous conversation. Uh, many marvelous conversations with David Haydu also inspired me along the way, and I continue to be grateful for his friendship and support. It speaks very highly of Ruth also. Um, I am also grateful to anyone else who has allowed me the pleasure of being smart or soulful in public. <laughs> so, why do I write? torturing myself to put it down. Ralph Ellison asks this question at the end of Invisible Man. I hope I am not at the end of my Bildung's Roman. Like Jack Benny, I'm 39 years old, the age Ellison was when he got his National Book Award, looking forward to another four decades of not finishing another novel. This is probably the last time I will be the most promising anything. I hope to live up to it. I receive this award gratefully for criticism, but I'm also writing more books for others to review, and I want those books to be beautiful and deep and true, and I want them to hold up to the standards of a critic working with intellectual honesty and good 
faith. As Brian Wilson would say, wouldn't it be nice? Uh, I dream of a time when wealth has promising, I could usher in the next generation of promising critics. In current dire predictions notwithstanding, I do believe they will exist. I've always vowed to keep my soul while climbing the greasy pole of academic promotion. And I hope to keep it as long as time allows. I hope in the year 2022, when I would be 49, having delivered what I signed up for and beyond, I can make a younger critic's day by giving her a prize. Thank you so much.